Heavenly Father, thank you so much for helping us to be here today. Be among our worship, Lord. Be touching our hearts, Lord. Touch us with the song. Touch, with the, touch us with your word. Help us to be effective tools in your kingdom, Lord. Touch our brothers that could not be here today with us, Lord. Touch uh, Brother Dan in the healing process. Heal him, Lord, and, and bring him back to us. Touch uh, Pastor Maury. Touch uh, Brother John. Help us, Lord, today that uh, getting out of here, Lord, to put in practice everything that we learn for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
us, Lord. thinking about Maury and how he would uh, come up here sometimes and talk about things that just, uh, you know, Maury was very uh, 
concerned about the world and our nation and how things were going. And well, I tell you, um, I was listening to the Pastor Bob the other day, and he, he's talked about how he's just turned off the news and just TV in general. And I've done that too. Just you just get tired of hearing about the same old things and just bickering and fighting and the vaccine and this and that and budgets and everything. And you can really get tied up into it. The problem is we we can't bury our heads either, right? We got to know what's going on, and that's the tough part. But um, the main thing I remember is there's so many. Even in the church, we have so much division between this whole issue with vaccines right now. And our key, the key is, I believe, and I, I'm. I'm positive that you guys think the same way. So we got to stay united, even though we have difference of opinions of what's going on. We need to be together. We need to be united. We need to know where, where's our source. Who do we go to for all the answers? We just go to Jesus. Amen. Amen. We got to stick to that because that's that's. I, if if you start getting into the the politics of your family and all the discussion, you tend to just it just separates and divides, and you see the distance. And it's sad to see, but let's not let that happen in our own church, right? We thank God for Calvary Chapel East Anaheim. We're able to come and we're able to, to worship and read and get together still. And, and um, just praying uh, also um, not to forget, uh, let's pray for um, Dan Watt and Maury and Haig too. So let's go before the Lord. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you so much for Calvary Chapel East Anaheim. We, we thank you that we're able to meet here. Lord, uh, we thank you for this building and the leadership that we have here, Lord, and all my brothers and sisters that we know. And Father, we just don't want to forget Dan. Uh, he is so intricate with uh, the men's Bible study here and setting up and the technical stuff that goes on that we have. And, and we just miss him. Father, I pray that you would just bring strength back to his legs, bring the feeling back to his legs, Father, get him up on his feet and get him walking again, Lord. And help Lynn, his wife, um, I'm sorry, Katie, and his daughter, Lynn, uh, as they go through it with them, Lord. And just give them strength. And, and Father, show us how to help them. A lot of men want to help, and we want to be there for them. So show us how to do that. And also for Haig. Uh, we miss Haig, too. He's not here, and, and it's, it's, just, it's just a hole, Lord, and we, we don't see him here. And he's also having problems walking, too. So... Lord, heal his legs. I know he's on this new medication he was talking about. And I pray that this medication works and he's able to stand on his two feet without that walker. And he's able to walk again and just bring the strength back. And just uh, uh, bless his wife, Marcy, too, Father, and Marcia, and be with her. And also uh, for Maury, too. Uh, we continue to pray for him as well, Father. It seems to be... Uh, uh, the issues with walking to Lord and other things as well. So bring strength back to Maury's legs and get him on his feet as well. We love him. We miss him so much, Father. I pray uh, someday that he'll be able to visit and be with us. So we thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this, the message that we're about to receive from you. Open our hearts, open our minds, and uh, show us what you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll let Bob Gascon come on up but we did uh, cut back our three-week uh, series down to two, and uh, we'll finish up a third week probably mid-September-ish um, because there's so much more to talk about when we address spiritual gifts. Um, gave you kind of a, a long, but I, I felt a needed outline of the setting of uh, uh, Paul and 1 Corinthians as we began last week just to be able to set in motion what the backdrop looked like and what he was really writing to. We had a fledgling church in Corinth that came from a very sinful city, um, but not all of the sinful city came out of the church. Uh, it was still there, and it troubled Paul greatly when he got the news back from Chloe's people that said, these things are going wrong and these, this church is off track. So Paul writes this letter as a letter of correction, um, condemning, of course, what they're doing, but not condemning the people. He refers to them as saints, which is a great deal of hope for us, knowing that we will get off track. There isn't condemnation. We have been saved by the blood of Christ, but he wants us back on track. And when I started last week, I talked in terms of why I thought it was important for us to actually know some of the underlying reasons why we should work together. 
You know, we hear Maury, we hear Tony, we hear Pastor Bob and people that come up and share with you on Fridays or from the pulpit say, we need to be together. And I always sit there thinking, well, why? To just come by and encourage one another, to sing to one another, to teach to you and to, for you to go home. But it's more than that. It's deeper. It's richer. And when we talk about the spiritual gifts, I separated them into the physiological approach to the spiritual gifts and the anatomical approach. The physiological says we function as one unit, as one body, as one organism. This structure we call the church is a structure. There's no mention in scripture how to build Calvary Chapel East Anaheim Church as a structure. The structure is you and me and each part that fits together intricately like the human body. And we can't do with any, without any of those parts. And if these parts are failing or diseased or are filled with cancer, they need to be fixed, removed, cured, isolated, and dealt with. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of 1 Corinthians when Paul says, look it. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware of your spiritual gifts. He's saying that because they were. Now, not only were they maybe unaware of the spiritual gifts and how to use them, but there was a great deal of abuse going on at the time. And we'll see that as we get into the anatomical part today, the bones of it. And I mentioned that I learned in high school from a uh, a class that was just an amazing class, learned a lot, suffered a lot in the, in, the, in the educational process of that class, though, studying so hard. But I did learn the physiology of the body and the anatomy of the body from a basic standpoint and realized that not only does everything have a function, but everything has a name. So on the anatomical side, obviously, if we're looking at the skeletal system, there's 206 bones, and we had to know every single one of them by name. That wasn't the fun part. The fun part is, how did they move? You can have bones scattered everywhere, but unless they're attached to ligaments and tendons and designed within the body and the nervous system and the muscular system while working together in the digestive system that helps the nutrients for those pieces to move, they don't. And that's where we find us today. So if you would open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are still in verses 1 through 12, but instead of reading all of those verses, I'm going to narrow it down and read verses 4 through 12. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. And there are a variety of effects, the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and another gifts of healing by the same Spirit and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things distributed, uh, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Let's pray. Father, um, we thank you for everything. Everything that we have, everything that we are is from you. And we pause just to thank you for each and every one of those blessings. And for those among us who are suffering with illnesses or suffering with uh, with the results of an accident and, and uh, cancer. And uh, Lord, there is so much heaviness, not just in this room, but throughout the church, country, and the world. We just pray, Father, that you lift the spirits of those suffering. And of those around us, Father, that we can continue to surround them with prayers. 
with, uh, with, our, with our hands and our feet that come to them as servants to be able to help in a time of need. But Lord, I thank you for these men that are here and I ask a blessing on them and on their families and on those that couldn't be here that you're with them this morning. For those that are watching in on YouTube, Father, that you bless them at home right now where they're at and we ask for their strength and their, and their health and their healing in Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. Um, there's these two guys, Randy and Bob, and they're sitting over at uh, Bodie Leaf Coffee having a nice little cup of brew, and they're looking at each other saying, you know, this retirement, not all that it's cracked up to be. I'd sure like to be busy doing something. I mean, it just seems like the days are long and getting longer. And so Randy looks at Bob and says, I got an idea. How about if we how about if we do a bungee jumping business in Mexico? And Bob looks back at Randy and says, you know, that just sounds a little crazy to me. I mean, nobody I know of does bungee jumping out there. He says, that's why it's brilliant, and that's why we're going to make a fortune. So Bob goes for it, and they together go down uh, to Home Depot and pick up the wood and pick up the cords and pick up everything necessary to build a bungee tower. They go across the border where Randy has already secured a little plot in Tijuana, and they start building this giant tower. And as they build the tower, all the kids from around the neighborhood start gathering around to see what these two guys are doing. The tower goes up, it's to the top completed. Bob and Randy climb up to the very top, they're on the platform, and Randy looks at Bob and says, it's my idea, I'm taking the maiden voyage. So he hooks on the bungee cord and yells, bungee, as he does swan dive right out of the edge down all the way to the bottom and into the crowd and springs back up. And Bob's got this smile on his face, but Randy doesn't. Randy seems to have a bloody nose. His head looks like it's cut, and Bob immediately thinks that cord's too long, tries to grab him. Candy goes down for a second dive into the crowd again. This time he comes up like a limp rag. Bob grabs him, puts him on the top of the tower and looks at him and shakes him and Randy is just about unconscious. He says, Randy, Randy, you okay? And Randy says, yeah, I think so. Bleeding from the nose, his eyes swollen. He says, Randy, Randy, was the cord too long? And Randy looks at Bob and says, no, but what does the word piñata mean? <laughs> you know, whether you cross the border and go to a a country with a different language, or whether you're taking a look at the spiritual gifts and you're not sure about that spiritual language, there is no room for the ignorance of not knowing. And Paul says specifically to the church in Corinth, I don't want you to be ignorant. Now we look at that word rather harshly, so we've changed it in a lot of Bibles and it says unaware. But the word is ignorant. I don't want you to be stupid about this, guys. I want you to understand what spiritual gifts are, and I want you to understand how they are used. And as he says here in verse 7, and I think it's very important part of the verses, it says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. This is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is giving you this gift Everybody gets at least one, and it's him being manifested through your life. It goes on to say, for the common good. Now, this isn't the only place in Scripture that we see this uh, analogy. And when we take a look at, towards the end of today, we're going to take a look at different places where Paul and Peter use this metaphor. And the metaphor is strong every time, that you are not to use these gifts for yourself. That's what was happening in Corinth. That's what's happening today in a lot of churches. We see that and we cringe, especially when it comes to the special gifts. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for today, what we're going to be focusing on is we're going to be focusing on the bones that represent the spiritual gifts, at least as it pertains to this part of Scripture. So the first one, if we can take a look at, is in uh, verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom 
it says, through the Spirit, and to another, the word of knowledge. So let's talk about the word of wisdom first. Um, these gifts, a lot of times when you study those in, in detail and you read different commentaries and do some digging into uh, to different parts of Scripture, you're going to find that these gifts are generally broken down by groups. Some of them are um, groups like motivational gifts, um, ministry gifts, manifestation gifts. Sometimes they're broken down according to groupings like administrative gifts, teaching gifts, bonding gifts, personal or special ministry gifts. I kind of like the way it's broken down when we see speaking gifts, serving gifts, and sign gifts. Much easier to be able to condense, consolidate, and to categorize so that we can figure out where each go. And when I go through these, I'll list them for you in, in their respective categories of the last that I mentioned. So the word of wisdom, which is a speaking gift, um, it really is someone that can talk the mind of Christ, someone who knows truly not just the word, but how to be able to adapt it and use it, interpret it in a way that says, here is the practical use of the word. And so much that it's generally the kind of person that you go to to consult with for the word. And we probably all have somebody that we know, boy, they're really wise, not just because they're a smart person, because the Holy Spirit has given them a special gift of wisdom. And they can take scripture and interpret it. And it's just amazing, and you go to them. I mean, I, I have those people in my life. My good friend Pat Butes is back there. Uh, Pat and I have known each other for years and years, but when I'm troubled with something personally or something in scripture, it's, hey, you got time for a cup of coffee or, or lunch or breakfast. Um, and what the Lord has given him is a gift to us. So he's got it, but he uses it for us. And that's the whole idea of spiritual gifts. In chapter 6 of Acts, verses 8 through 10, we see Stephen brought before the council. That's the, the synagogue of the freedmen. And some of you know that story or know that part of scripture. And in that part of scripture, we see Stephen being challenged. And, and here is this UN, the United Nations of this synagogue, because you've got these freed uh, Jews from all over the area in this one synagogue. And in Jerusalem, there was one temple, but there were a lot of synagogues. And this particular one was challenging them. They didn't like what he was saying. But they couldn't cope with the wisdom that he had. They were unable to do that, so they had to make up some fake news and move them along to see if they couldn't uh, uh, prosecute him and persecute him in the way that they eventually did. But it was wisdom from the Holy Spirit. It's something beyond what you and I would have on a natural basis. The next in verse eight is, is the word of knowledge. And that word of knowledge is somebody that can bring out the truth in God's word. And not only bring out the truth in God's word, but can set it aflame as they deliver it to you, as they, as they talk to you about it. It's someone who you'd listen to and say, that person is anointed, because they are. The Holy Spirit is manifesting that gift within their life, and it comes out to you, and you are hearing it go, wow, that is really cool, listening to Scripture in that way, in that light. The next is um, verse 9, and that is faith. It says, to another, faith by the same Spirit. Faith, a true belief in the power, the will, and the nature of God to do that which is consistent with his teaching and his word. You know, when we talk about that, though, a lot of times people will take that and say, yeah, faith, I've got that kind of faith. It's not about you having that kind of faith. It's how do you deliver that kind of faith to someone else? Remember, it's a spiritual gift for somebody else's benefit. So let me just ask you, can you think of anywhere in Scripture where you see that kind of faith where Jesus said, <clears throat> He is healed because of your faith. Can you think of that? Anybody come to mind? Are you Bible students? Lowering the guy through the roof. Tearing the top. <clears throat> Here's this poor guy. <clears throat> been a paralytic for his life. <clears throat> and his buddies put him on, a, on a, a bed, a pallet, 
slab of wood. They crane him up to the top of the roof. They tear off the roof where Jesus is teaching and they let him down. And Jesus says, you're healed because of their faith. Now you realize how powerful that is and what that means to you and I? That we can, by faith, bring people to Jesus. And we do. How do we do that? Well, we pray. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. Some of you have heard that story in my testimony. He was an alcoholic for 50 years. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't stop drinking until he was 67 years old. So I grew up in an alcoholic home. Never hit us physically, but was belligerent and would make us cry from the time I was this big because he'd yell at us every night. And it was really terrible to go through, but when we became believers, we, were, we grew up Catholic and we came to know Jesus and have a personal relationship when we were in our teens. We prayed for my dad, I remember, for, I mean, 30 years. Nothing happened. We just lost hope. I actually stopped praying after about 30 years. I said, this one cannot change. But I had an aunt who brought us all to the Lord, one by one in our family from our Catholic upbringings. This faithful woman continued to pray for 50 years every day for him. She'd come to the house in the morning for coffee before she went to work and stop by at night and be with my mom. And they were buddies and grew up together, obviously. And my mom was a few years older and always took care of her little sister. But she would come and she would pray for my dad every day. And my dad came to a saving faith in Christ at 67 years old. That's how we deliver that faith that the Lord has put in us as a spiritual gift to someone else. It's a powerful gift. And like so many of the gifts that we have, we kind of discount these as we look at the bigger gifts, the ones of evangelism or the ones of prophecy or the ones of pastor-teacher because they seem to be the ones that are up on the pulpit. But all these other gifts are all the internal organs of this body that has to function and it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The next one we see on the list is also in verse 9, and it's that of healing. Now we're starting to get into some of the sign gifts, by the way, and these sign gifts are the ones that get most abused, not just in the Church of Corinth, but the Church of America and across the globe. Healing, the effects of miracles and speaking in tongues and the interpretation in tongues are the other powerful sign gifts. As I mentioned last week, one of the controversies is whether or not these gifts even exist today, or are they just for the apostolic age when the church was building and the apostles used those to bring people to Christ and then they have disappeared. This church, Calvary Chapel, uh, doesn't believe that those gifts are gone. They believe that those gifts and all the gifts are still in play today. And the Holy Spirit has the right to give those to whoever he wants to. Special gifts, but I want to pass a warning along with that. When you see the gifts of healing, even throughout Scripture, it's not that those who have healed others, whether it was Jesus or Peter or Paul or Stephen or Philip, it wasn't just that they were healing. They were healing specific people according to God's plan and God's will. They weren't just going down the streets, touching everybody and healing everything. Didn't work like that. Even in the case where Jesus went into the pool of Bethesda at the sheep gate, you know what happened. Remember, there's a paralytic, well, there's somebody that's paralyzed in there, but there are a whole lot of people in there. He chose one. Why not the rest of them? We don't know. But apparently, it was God's will for him to choose this one. Now, healing comes in a couple of different flavors. Healing comes with immediate healing of somebody or a delayed healing. Some people think, well, if it's not immediate, that it's not a healing. That's just not the case. Because sometimes it takes time. Joe, we talked about Susan when we talked a day or two ago, and she is doing much better. And it is nothing short of a miracle or a healing. Now, she's not healed yet, but she's healing. Is that what the Lord has in mind with it? We don't know. <clears throat> but we do know that we are to gather together in prayer and ask for that healing and continue in that. 
and not be frustrated that it doesn't happen immediately. And look at Dan Watt. Many of us have visited Dan. I am praying for a healing. But I'm not just going to go one and done and touch his leg and then go away. We're going to just be on our knees fighting for that man and fighting for our brother until the day that he dies. I believe that, you know, even though the doctors say, okay, you know, it may be four months or six months before we know for sure if he'll regain the strength or power in his legs to walk. It may be. But I'm going to keep praying past that if it doesn't work. Because I'm not putting anything past our God. He can do whatever he wants to. And by the way, he can work through every doctor and every nurse and every nutritionist and every person that's in the science field making and manufacturing medicine that God designed somewhere and they figured it out finally. So let's not discredit that healing or downplay it in any way. The next is miracles. Again, another thing that in the sign gifts that gets abused very easily. Miracles. The miracles can be a miracle of a healing, but it's sometimes and mostly we see a supernatural uh, miracle in nature. The parting of the Red Sea, the rolling back of the Jordan. I mean, we can go through miracle upon miracle and we see those from a standpoint of both physical, because they happen so quickly, or Jesus calms the sea and and the storm, and it happens immediately. But miracles, when they do happen, unlike healings which could be delayed, miracles are immediate. They're now, and they're shocking because they are so much out of the ordinary, and they are so supernatural in nature. Um, The abuses we see within the churches, the name it and claim it, the blab it and grab it preachers, do these miracles and these healings and take their coats off and, you know, and everybody's healed and nobody really is because of money. That's what was happening also in Corinth. It was about position, power, prestige. It was about, mm, you know, making a few dollars on the side. Paul says, stop that. Right now, stop that. This is an abuse. This is not how it's supposed to work. Let's get back on track. And so he brings them back on track. A few years ago, a good friend of mine, been a friend for 30-some years now. He's been suffering for years with an inoperable, benign brain tumor, just kind of right in the center of his brain. They can't get to it. When they first discovered it some 25 years ago, the doctors say, look it, uh, we can try to go in surgically, but there's only a 20% chance of success. Well, what's the other 80%? <laughs> the other 80% is you're going to bleed out and die because we won't be able to stop the bleeding there, or you're going to be paralyzed or lose some part of your bodily function. So it's not worth the risk. Science is improving, medicine is improving, it's now up to about a 50% chance. Still not worth the risk. It's a benign tumor controlled by heavy medication that needs to constantly be monitored and increased. Bless his heart, he's still working, he's 60-ish, been working all his life, but his work day is limited by the amount of strength and how he can see or his dizziness He wakes up every morning after taking a medication and vomits every morning as he starts, and that's his day. He loves the Lord, praise the Lord. He's been highly involved within ministry and his church. Just a great guy, wonderful man. About three years ago, maybe four years ago now, he called me, and I could tell he was distraught, asked to come over to his office. I did, shared with me that the doctors had discovered two rather large lumps on his Uh, lymph glands, and they had done biopsy, they had done some scans and determined that he's got cancer, and that it was growing and that it needed to be removed immediately. And they didn't know how bad it it was until they got in there, 
But he got a second opinion, doctor confirmed. Got a third opinion, that doctor confirmed. The elders prayed over him. Several of us continued to pray over him. He got ready for surgery the day before. They wanted one more scan so the doctor performing the surgery would make sure he knew how big it's grown now and where it was at and couldn't find a thing. He couldn't find it. The doctor was amazed, thought there was something wrong with the radiology department, sent him down for another test, not one thing. Called the first doctor and the second doctor for confirmations on their slides, sent the slides over, the mass is definitely there, definitely look cancerous, tests all came back positive. Those doctors says, well, your test must be wrong. They looked at it, did another test, nothing. Four years later now, still nothing. Now, I think that's a miracle. It may not be a healing because he still has the tumor. But I'll tell you what, we rejoiced and said that's the Holy Spirit at work and the brothers that surrounded him, that touched him, that prayed for him, and that fought from their knees and didn't give up. That's what it looks like. And that's what it should look like. Not some of this goofy stuff you see in some of the other churches out there the next is prophecy. Prophecy is not a fortune teller. It's not having a crystal ball. It's not predicting based on what's happening in Iran and Iraq today that I think this is going to work. Prophecy is forth telling or telling forth the God's unadulterated truth to you, to other people. And it's not just in what's going to happen in the future, but it's what's happening in the present and also what's happening in the past. And sometimes those people delivering this prophetic message, they don't even know themselves clearly what that is. And that's the way the Holy Spirit wants to keep it. But that is prophecy. The next is distinguishing or discerning of spirits. Sometimes we don't even talk about this spiritual gift. And the discerning of spirits is so important especially as the days draw nearer. Why? These are those with the spiritual gift, that manifestation, that are the protectors of the spirit of the church. When they hear something that doesn't sound right, they pick it up like this. When they see somebody who is saying or acting, they pick it up like this. I've seen it at work firsthand. I'm amazed at it because I look, I go, hey, I think I'm pretty aware of people's personalities and things to say, and I didn't hear anything wrong, and this person who will remain nameless says, no, there's something wrong here. There's something going on. Let's dig through the word and let's pray together. And sure enough, it may have taken a few weeks or months later and it revealed itself and you go, my goodness, how did I miss that? Because Satan reveals himself as a light. You know, and you still don't know until you've got, you know, either yourself buried in the word where you can hear it. And this angel of light comes and shines and it seems okay. But those with the spirit, the discerning spirit, distinguishing and discerning spirit, boy, I'll tell you what. They can see that, feel that, sense that. Billy Graham writes this about it. He says, these are, these are people who have the manifestation of the discerning spirits can see, can, sit, can consider, they examine, they understand, they hear, and they can judge closely what they're hearing. And the church needs these people. The next is tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now, I don't need to say a whole lot about that because that's probably been the most talked about of all the spiritual gifts throughout time, I think. We see it two different ways. In the book of Acts chapter 2, we see it at Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they spoke in a tongue but a language that those around the area could hear in their own home accent and language. And then there is the gift of tongues an interpretation of tongues, which would be a foreign language that someone would speak, but there needs to be somebody around that can interpret it. And a lot of times churches take advantage of that as they start squealing and rattling off stuff and causing confusion in the church. Paul says we don't need and want any of that confusion either. I remember Pastor Chuck mentioned a, a time when he was teaching and somebody died, decided in the middle of his message to stand up and speak in tongues, and he really condemned them. And, and ask them to be removed because the Holy Spirit is not going to interrupt himself. And if he was speaking as the Holy Spirit, that person wouldn't be speaking at the, at the same time. <clears throat> so 
I think we need to be really careful of that, understand that it still exists, that the Lord will put that on the hearts of people, that the Holy Spirit still has the right to give those, some people the gift of, of speaking in tongues and those in the interpretation of tongues. And then a lot of people that have this will do it in their own prayer closet. I don't have a problem with that. This church, again, um, supports speaking in tongues, so uh, uh, I, I'm all for it. Well, it's not an exhaustive list. We only talked about a few. If we go further in chapter 12 and verse 28, we see a handful more of spiritual gifts, obviously because of time. We're not going to get into all of those. If we take a look at Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 alone, there's 17 spiritual gifts mentioned. If we go to Romans 12, there are seven spiritual gifts mentioned. If we go to Ephesians 4, there's five spiritual gifts mentioned. If you add up those numbers, that's 29. However, there's a lot of overlap that next time we'll talk about. So Paul will mention the same one in a couple of, of cases. So if you consolidate that and take away the duplicates or the triplicates, there's 18 spiritual gifts. Now, some theologians and scholars, and Billy Graham in particular, says there are 20. He adds a couple more on there that he is interpreting that aren't specifically said these are spiritual gifts, but he interprets them as spiritual gifts. Well, these, these are not deal breakers anyhow. These are not, you know, essential Christian doctrine where you're going to lose your salvation if you believe there's 18 or there's 20 or there's 27 of them. But it's important for us to know what these are. More important than that, it's to know what spiritual gift you have or spiritual gifts you have. And all I want to say to that is what I said last week. If you are not using your spiritual gifts, would you please do that? Because this body of believers needs you. No matter what those spiritual gifts are, there are no insignificant spiritual gifts or the Holy Spirit would not have activated us in that way. I'm going to close with this. We've talked about the physiology. We've talked about the anatomy. I want to talk about one more thing. Do you have that slide to be able to do it in that order? Um, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. We know these verses. We've seen these verses. This is just 25. And it says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the case of, you see that, as the case of, as a habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. You're familiar with that. Every teacher and pastor will bring that up and say that's why we need to get together. We need to be together on Sunday, on Wednesdays, any chance we get on Fridays, in the women's group, any type of activities. We need to come together. I like that word assembly, but the word assembly means something different than we generally use it. If you turn to the next slide, Josh. Um, there is a word in Greek called episunagoge. Episunagoge, I did that to impress you. Episunagoge is a deeper word than gathering. So when we talk about not forsaking the gathering or the coming together, as some of your Bibles say, it really is not correct. It does mean assembling. You can't see that very good because unfortunately my computer crashed this week and so this is a picture of a picture sent to my email, sent to their email, sent to bad resolution. Last week I talked about my granddaughter's little kitchen that I built about seven years ago. Came in pieces and it said some assembly required. This is some assembly. This is their pool table and it's all the pieces there and there's pieces all around it. That's a gathering. That, that is gathering all of us. The next slide, though, is assembly. This is an assembled gathering. This word in Greek means to you and I that when we come to church, we are the church. When we come to church, we assemble together. We don't just gather together, but we are built together. And when you take a look at the definition in the Greek, it's real simple. It says, to form from parts together, to build together, either in parts or material. And that, to me, is more rich and deeper than just gathering. So you can gather together like all the pieces, or you can assemble 
together, and that's what we do as a church. Why do we need each other? Because we want to look like this. We want to look like one body gathered together to the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we could just be together, not just gathering, but assemble together as one body and one spirit in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for these gifts that you've given to us. I pray that each man here knows what his gift is, and if not, that he discovers, and that more importantly, he uses it for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. It's true, isn't it? We're all one body, but many members, right? And we see that every morning as we come in here. We see the guys in the back cooking. We see the guys over here with uh, Josh kicking in with the technology there for me. That was awesome. And he's also gifted in uh, speaking and, and uh, uh, his role as being a pastor too with the kids. And, and then the guys over here, you see over here with the worship and everything. Hey, John coming on in. And um, uh, Dan not being here. And then Brian who just left too. So you see, we can do it all together. If I had to do it, I'd be all over the place. There's just no way. If Bob had to come and say, hey, Bob, you got to get your slides going too. Yeah, how's he going to do that? I mean, I'm sure there's ways, but it's just not, not the way it is. And we need to be together. We need to assemble together, too. And one of those things that brought to memory about um, how Pastor Bob does, too, is we just pray, pray together, right? We, we come together and we pray for the guys on this 911 uh, um, team that we have. And one of the times we went out and we prayed for Joe, who's over here to my left. Recently, Joe's just told me that he's uh, been... Uh, Di the, the cancer, he's completely cancer free now. And I believe that's because of prayer. And he doesn't want me to point him out right now, but that's, we get together and we did that. We prayed for him and we saw that happen. So I believe that we need to do that. We need to assemble together and we need to pray for our, each and every one of us, and especially family members, and I think of Joe here too, and just continue to pray, to pray for Susan, his wife, and to pray for everybody else who needs prayer. If you need prayer, come to us, talk to us. I know everybody's got something going on in their life, right? Jim just talked to me this morning about a dear friend of his. He needs prayer. There's, there's all kinds of prayer that's needed. We need to be together. We need to assemble together like Bob was sharing. Um, there's a couple things I also wanted to talk to you about. Don't forget about the men's retreat coming up. That's coming up in September 24th through the 26th. Uh, one of the things that I'd like you guys to really think about is we all have these gifts, right? Why don't we utilize those gifts by also leading some of our younger guys, our younger generation, to the men's retreat somehow? There's that gap between the older guys here. Not all of us are old, but gray hairs, but some of us are a little younger. Not too many. Um, but how do we bridge that gap between the younger generation and us? It's always been an issue. I shared that time when I was at the gym, and I saw those two kids. I didn't know how old they were. They were 19, 20, 21, and I saw something different in them. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for someone they can look to and say, hey, how do I get from point A to point B? Let me show you the way, guys. Let me show you the way. We need to do that. We need to reach out and touch these guys and show them, hey, and you matter to us. We care about you. We love you as brothers and sisters and as a church. We love you. We want to get involved with you. We want to know about your lives. We want to know what's going on. We want to help you, Okay. There's a lot of kids that I know of that don't have leadership. They don't have a father that's leading them. And they don't know what to do. They're lost. If we can step in, be praying that, you know, God just shows you who. He's given me a few guys to, to pray for that uh, to invite to the men's retreat. Think about that. Think about who you could uh, bring over. I know it's, it's really important. It's very important. We need to do that. Also, the... Um, the prayer watch. Fernando and Bernie are in involved in that. Fernando's going to be out on uh, August the 24th through September 2nd. So we need someone to, to, um, uh, to join Bernie. And it's from 6 a.m. To, se to 7 in the morning, uh, Monday through Thursday, during that time frame. So if you're available, let us know. Uh, somehow, some way, talk to Fernando or Bernie or any of us over here. Talk to us and we'll make that happen. Also, one other thing, Dave Grace, he's always here. The Lord put him on my heart this morning. His mom is going through a really hard time right now in the hospital. So keep him in mind. You know, pray for his mom. That, uh, they're able to um, fix what's wrong with her 
and uh, get her home. So thank you, guys. I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you for coming out early. As Maury would say, thank you for getting up early. I know it's hard, but thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a great day.